I don't know if I need to mention this or if I'm being clear this time. If I hadn't known you, I wouldn't have seen through Lem. I might have seen him as he saw himself, and the official mythology defined him as a rebel, an insurgent. Lem obviously didn't fill the gap I'd felt since my release. Unlike you, I didn't have any friends here. There was no Jan said like I could run to. When I finally did find a genuine friend, it was someone who had something in common with the Sedlaks. Like them, he moved on the fringes. He wasn't a peasant, but he was just as much of an outsider. His name was Ron Matthews. I had seen him walk through the halls of the school with his three companions, all in leather jackets, long before I had met Lem. I had seen him during lunch hours, heading towards a wall behind the parking lot to smoke with his companions. Other students, as well as most of the teachers, were afraid of them, though I had never seen any of them raise a hand against anyone. Lem called them the Lumpen. They modeled themselves after gangsters in movies and comic books. Ron, the tallest and strongest of the four, was the leader. Behind his back, students called him the Commissar, a nickname he was known to dislike. His mother taught at the school, and it was said she was a subversive. She was, in fact, fired sometime later for her political beliefs. It was she who converted Lem. I didn't meet her till years later. Ron was repeating the first year of high school for the third time. He had left elementary school only because the school's principal had been afraid of him. His three companions were supposed to be his bodyguards, but in terms of size and strength, he was obviously theirs. On their own, they wouldn't have made much of an impression. I began to look forward to the lunch hour. Boredom, loneliness, and curiosity drove me further and further into the parking lot, closer to the wall. One day, I walked to the other side of the wall. One of the lieutenants nudged Ron, who turned to look at me. Well, well, what have we got over here? Come a little closer, baby, so we can have a better look at you. You want to smoke? While Ron spoke, the other three grinned stupidly. I'm not a baby, and I have a name. Let's see, Soap Feet Natural. Is that a name, boys? All three nodded. Okay, Natural. Would you like to join us in the pleasure of smoking a cigarette? He handed me his pack. Thank you, Tarzan. Pleasure is exactly what I came for. That wasn't exactly what role I wanted to play, nor how far I wanted to play it. Hey, we've been wondering about you. If you're smart enough to ace out that wise-ass coach, why'd you let him sock you? Because you weren't there to protect me, Superman. So far, so good, but then I tripped. I burst out coughing while he lit my cigarette, and then it became obvious to all four that I had never smoked before. Ron took up the offensive again. Now look at what we're doing, boys, dragging this nice girl across the state line. We're committing the man act. Don't flatter yourself, muscles. I walked here by myself. What do your boyfriend say about that? He'll say we committed the man act. While we're on the boyfriend, tell us what a nice girl like you wants with a shit-on-a-stick professor. If I'd known there were commissars like you around, I wouldn't have ever noticed that one. You've got a sharp tongue, Miss Not-So-Low. If you don't watch out, they'll clip it right out of your mouth. They wouldn't dare if you four strong men protected me. Ron laughed. His three cronies just continued to grin. He turned to them and said, You meatheads hear that? She just contracted us as private dicks. That angered me, and I started to walk away. Goodbye, Tarzan. Thanks for the cigarette. Don't leave yet, baby. We didn't mean that the way it sounded, did we, boys? We ain't even got half acquainted yet. I didn't hear what you meant, Tarzan, and it sounded like goodbye. I continued back away from them. Not so low, baby. You get sore too easy. Not sore. Prove it, natural. How's about meeting me here around midnight tonight? You're too much, Tarzan. You think I'd trust my body to someone who butchers my name? The three bodyguards responded for the first time. They laughed at Ron. I rounded the walls and started back across the parking lot. Ron followed me to the parking lot and shouted, I get it. A nice girl like you wouldn't want to be stuck in an empty lot with a crazy ape that'll rape her and then knife her. You wouldn't want to get stuck at night, but you want to see what the ape looks like in broad daylight, right? That's right, I shouted back. I've never seen an ape before. For an instant before he turned his back to me, Ron looked like an injured child who was going to cry. You bitch, he whispered, kicking the dirt as he disappeared behind the wall. I regretted my last comment. I liked him. Under the mask of the dunce who failed all his courses, I saw a lively intelligence which refused to submit to the school routine. Under the leather jacket and the gang leader's pose, I thought I recognized a genuine rebel, the first one I'd met here. I was hungry for activity that was not part of the official routine. I was hungry for the companion who had not been the cast in one of the standard molds. I longed for you, for the comrades and projects I had left behind. I thought there was a strong resemblance. The form was altogether different. The content seemed the same. I crossed the schoolyard again the following day. With his back toward me, Ron said quietly, as if he were pleading with me, Look, lady, 
Do us the favor of letting us enjoy our privacy on our own grounds, by which we mean we would like for you to remove yourself from this territory. I apologize, Ron. We would like for you to get out of here, he said, still quietly. I didn't mean what I said yesterday, I told him. He turned towards me. His face was flushed. The anger mounted in his voice as he said, We don't accept apologies from the likes of you, lady. Now kindly do us the favor of getting the hell out of here. It was you who put the words in my mouth, Ron, I pleaded. All four were staring at me now. Ron turned to the other three and shouted, Looks like the lady is deaf, boys. I'll meet you here any time. He stepped backwards and almost fell. You'll what? A day or night, I continued, almost whispering. Lady, would you rep please repeat that? All his anger was gone. What's my name? I asked, still whispering. I was afraid. Sophie Nachello, he shouted. Had he known it all along, or had he learned it since the previous day? Set the time. My knees were trembling. I thought I'd start crying. Do you mean that you, Sophie Nachello, are going to trust me? I didn't let him finish. I could no longer hide my nervousness. Right here, I asked, starting to run off. At midnight? Tonight? I ran as fast as I could. I shook for hours. I thought I'd get sick. My fear didn't leave me until midnight that night. Ron was already there, sitting up against the part of the wall closest to the street lamp, smoking. He didn't look up. I sat down an arm's length away from him. He didn't move. I suddenly realized that he was as nervous as I had been. It was I who asked, You're not afraid of me, are you? He looked at me. He seemed so sad. I was going to wait here all night, but I never thought you'd come. He turned to look at the ground again and puffed on his cigarette. I saw that he had shaved and combed his hair. By himself, he was only a boy. Shy, nervous, and lonely. I thought you met girls here every night, I said, although I didn't really think that. Are you kidding? He asked somewhat bitterly. Haven't you ever been with a girl at night? Yeah, sure, he said with growing bitterness. I spent lots of nights with two-bit whores. The others talk a lot, but that's all they ever do. And that's right, too. You shouldn't have come out here, Sophie. No decent girl goes out at night looking for an ape. I'm sorry, I said, reaching for his hand. He took my hand and squeezed it. Yeah, I know. I put the words in your mouth. We sat like that for at least half an hour. I was relieved to learn he was harmless, but a half an hour sitting on concrete is awfully long. I got bored and extremely uncomfortable. Is this all that's going to happen, I asked? He jumped up as if I woke him. Would the lady like to have a guided tour of the city at night? Why, yes, that's exactly what the lady would like, I said eagerly, squeezing his hand with both of mine when he helped me get up. My eagerness was genuine. I hadn't yet seen the city even in the daytime. The city Ron showed me must have been very similar to the city you knew during the war. It consisted of hideouts, danger zones, places to investigate, and places to avoid. It was Ron's personal private world. He had never shown it to anyone else. He let me share it. Someday I'll show you where the other half lives, he said as we walked along, one after another street lined with almost identical two-storied houses. This is where the ants live. Sometimes I come here before school starts, about six or seven in the morning. I watch them all file out of their houses with their lunch boxes, like kids coming out of John's. They all pile into their cars at the same time, and then they all sit on the highway blowing their brains out because the traffic can't move. The ones who live here drive to a plant on the other side of town, and those who live there drive all the way over here. If they're not deaf when they get here, the noise in the plant finishes them off, but they honk their brains out all the way back home because they're all on the road again. It's not their fault, is it, I ventured. You don't know what you're talking about. Some of those guys drive bulldozers. They could push the factory straight in the river if they wanted to. We walked on. He led me through quarters that looked like the forest that had burned. Pointing to an immense lot that looked like the city's garbage dump, he said, that's what they spent all their time making in this town. As we got closer, I realized it was a dump for wrecked cars. Beyond the lot, there were two-storied houses that were more run down than the ones we had passed through earlier. Pointing to one of them, he said, the guy who lives there makes it without going to the plants. He takes batteries out of cars and resells them in a store he runs. Once I watched him and another guy clean out all the batteries in a parking lot. It's hard fucking work, though. We sat down on the sidewalk. I know the kid next door, too, Ron continued. His old man's a cop. You'd think he'd be on to the batteries by now, but that's not his job. He spends his time patrolling this whorehouse on the other side of town. Downstairs, there's a bar where lots of dope is sold. He makes twice as much from the bar as he gets from his job, and they go on a big trip every year. But shit, who wants to be a cop? We sat down and smoked. I asked Ron how he knew these people. He said that he'd lived here before moving near the school. I know this other guy down the street, he said. His old man builds motors. He works in a machine shop, and every day he takes home a small part in the false bottom of his lunchbox. Every six or seven months, he's got a whole motor put together. 
Then he sells it to this place that deals in motors. I used to think that was neat, but now I think he must have his brains up his ass. He could have started his own machine shop 20 years ago and he'd have it made by now. We got up and walked on. The structure around the corner looked like an abandoned railway car. That's what it was. On top was a sign that said diner. That's where my old man hangs out, Ron told me. Mean he eats there? No, nah, he runs it. He flips the eggs and butters the toast from eight in the morning till eight at night, six days a week. He saved for years to buy this dump. He thought it would make him a businessman. Me and my buddies skipped afternoon classes lots of times just so as to get here around noon. That's when it's busy as hell here. Everyone's hollering at him. Lots of them are eating standing. As soon as we go through the door, the hollering stops and everyone looks at us like we're dignitaries or something. My old man gets mad at hell, but it doesn't let on that he's ever seen me before. He skips everyone else and asks what we want. No one objects. It's like they'd all agree that we get served first. And he sure as hell doesn't want us standing around waiting. We really get on his ass. Eight eggs, I tell him. Sunny side up, on the double. We ain't got all day. You should see him run. He moves so fast you think the eggs fell from the ceiling. He looks just like a flunky getting an order on the army. The only thing he doesn't do is say, yes, sir, some businessman. He holds it all in until he gets home, and then he goes off like a time bomb. I ask him why the hell he's so mad. I was just bringing in some business. That's what he's in there for, isn't it? Didn't we pay for our eggs like everyone else? Is he going to put up a sign that says no hoods, dogs, or relatives allowed? We walk by the house where Ron used to live. Don't know who lives here now. Must be a gardener. There are flowers in the front lawn. I asked Ron about his mother. She's a commie, he said, as matter-of-factly as if he was saying she's tall. He considered and rejected this possibility as well. She started being one during the Depression. She likes to talk about it, but I never stood any of that shit about workers wanting commies to run unions and factories. I never met anyone who wanted that, but she thought that's what they wanted, and the union paid her to organize workers to want that. After the war, the union threw her out on her ass, and not one worker stood up for her. She still thinks that's what everyone wants. She's like this religious nut I know who thinks everyone wants to die so as to see Jesus in the sky. Now the school's getting ready to throw her out on her ass again, and those crazy bastards will do it too. I don't understand any of that shit either. When the commies had a chance before the war, they left them alone. Now that there are hardly any of them left and they don't have a chance, everyone's jumping on them like a gang of perverts raping a kid. Shit, he concluded, flinging a cigarette into the gutter. Those are the bastards who say I'm the one that's dangerous. It was starting to get light out when Ron walked me to my house. He squeezed my hand and asked me to take a bike trip with him the following weekend. I accepted. I was happy. I had found a friend. The next day I dozed during all my classes. I looked forward to the weekend. I was in love for the second time in my life. Yet I imagined I was continuing my first love. In my daydreams, I imagined myself riding with leaflets under my arm, and you were on the bicycle next to me. I was out of practice, and we didn't get far, though we did get out of the city. We left our bikes in a cornfield and walked until we reached a pond. We were completely alone. The road and the nearest farmhouse were at least a mile away. Ron told me the owner sometimes fished in the pond, but only early in the morning. He'd been there before. Although the sun had gone down, and it hadn't been a warm day, we were both sweating from the ride and the walk. Ron removed his clothes and slipped into the pond. I followed him. When we came out, we made love on the grassy bank. That night, a full moon made the mist of the pond look like steam. The pond seemed to be evaporating. I felt as if I was spending the night in a Dutch landscape painting. But I couldn't sleep. I had never before experienced such silence. I missed the city noises I'd grown so used to blocking out, and I concentrated on the few sounds there were, sounds that were completely unfamiliar to me. Rustling leaves, crickets, and Ron's breathing. I watched the moon fall into a field on the other side of the pond. And when it got completely dark, I started worrying that the farmer would choose the next morning to come fishing. I heard the farmer coming. I imagined him coming with a rifle and not a fishing pole whenever a squirrel or a bird stirred in the branch of a nearby tree. When the sky started to get light, I woke Ron and told him I'd heard something coming. He jumped up and we put our clothes on. We'd use them as blankets. As soon as he was dressed, he stood still and listened. Oh shit, Sophie, he said, annoyed and somewhat angry. That's the crickets you heard. Those people don't fish on Sunday morning. They go to church. But when I yawned and he saw how tired I, I must have looked, he put his arms around me and whispered, I should have turned those crickets off before going to sleep so they wouldn't keep you awake. I heard them all night once, too. You sorry you came? No, I'm happy, I whispered. And to prove it, I started crying, probably because I was exhausted. I'd like to come every weekend. We did go there two more times, but I never again saw the steam rise from the pond, nor did I listen to the crickets and leaves all night, and we didn't once meet the fisherman farmer. 
The following weekend, we set out on two completely different bikes. I learned that Ron had sold the previous two bicycles and stolen the new ones. How do you think I'd get my spending money from my old man, he asked. I've been stealing them since elementary school. It's easy. You take a pocket-sized saw to the back of any move-it house, and you select whichever one you want. I only take the chain ones. I figure if a kid's so poor that he can't buy a chain, he wouldn't want to lose his bike. I puncture a tire and take it down to the basement and tell my mom that kids pay me to fix and paint their bikes. She actually thinks that's what I do. The old man thinks I steal them, but then he thinks I robbed a bank every time I stayed out all night, so he doesn't bother making a fuss about little things like bikes. He couldn't prove much anyways unless he caught me doing it, which he'd love to do, but he loves to flip his eggs even more. A little spray paint takes care of the body, sandpaper and a little solder takes care of the number, and a little sticker takes care of the registration. No sweat, and it's like new. I learned it all from my half-brother. All you have to watch is that you don't dangle the sawed-off chain in front of a cop, like one kid I know who got sent off to reform school. It's not an easy enough, but I didn't volunteer to join Ron in this activity, as Sabina did sometime later. I only enjoyed the fruits of Ron's labors. For the sake of our weekend trips, he started specializing in bicycles that were lighter and better suited for long journeys, and by our third or fourth excursion, I could ride as far and long as he. Two or three times we ran into storms, and once we spent an afternoon and night in a barn with horses. In addition to our sandwiches, I frequently took my notebook with me on the excursions, especially when we decided ahead of time not to spend the whole weekend riding. I loved to sit under a tree in a field or on a rock by a lake, jotting down my observations about myself and about Ron. Much of this letter is taken directly out of that very notebook. I told Ron that someday I'd write a novel about him. He assured me he'd never read it. So I could write about him if I saw a point in that, but I shouldn't bother writing it for him. I told him his name would be Yaristein. He said the name alone would keep him from recognizing himself. I did, in fact, intend to write a novel about Yaristein. He was going to be a composite of you and Ron. But I never got further than to jot down some of my experiences and conversations with Ron. The better I got to know him, the less suitable he became from the story I had in mind. The character of my story, composed of the two of you, was going to express my own feelings, my own observations, my own choices. I gradually and sadly realized that Ron was not the same as I at all. Ron became aware of this difference much sooner than I. The very first time I opened my notebook, when we had just sat down by a tree on top of a hill, he got up and said he was going for a walk. He wasn't jealous of the notebook. He didn't consider it an intruder or an obstacle that came between us. He didn't even mind when I wanted to write instead of accompanying him for a walk. The notebook instantaneously defined me as a person who would one day be very far away from him, a person he would not recognize and probably wouldn't even remember as a one-time friend. The first time I opened my notebook, he knew our relationship would be short. He probably thought he would be the one to end it. If so, he was wrong only about that. I was the one who ended it, and for the very reason he thought it would end. But before it ended, I did have a chance to undergo two adventures which compare with nothing I experienced before or since. One Sunday, we returned from our weekend very late at night. We had spent most of the day sleeping on the lakeside beach, and both of us were wide awake. We rode to Ron's house, and he asked me to accompany him to his room. I agreed partly because I wanted to play, but mainly because I wanted to see what his room was like. As we were tiptoeing in the dark up the stairs from his basement, the light suddenly came on and a voice thundered, Where the hell do you think you're going? A tall, thin, vicious-looking man wearing pajamas and an overcoat glared down at us from the top of the stairs. It was Ron's father. I was out of my wits with fright. Oh shit, Ron said. Why don't you go to bed and mind your own fucking business? You punk, the man shouted. You're not bringing any broads into my house. A woman's voice, Ron's mother shouted. Come back to bed, Tom, and leave the kid alone, for Christ's sake. He's bringing a woman into the house, Tom Matthew shouted. So what, you jackass? Haven't you ever heard of that? She shouted back. You heard her pop, Ron said, still calm. Now go back to bed and leave us alone. I'm not going anywhere until you get that whore out of here, the man said. I started trembling. Don't you call her that pop, said Ron, raising his voice. I'm calling her a whore, and I'm telling you to take her back to the whorehouse. I could feel Ron starting to shake. He waved his fist, took a step toward the man, and shouted, Call her that one more time, and I'll... You'll, you'll what, sonny boy? Kill me? You'd love to do that, wouldn't you? Don't you think I've been waiting for that every day for years? You don't think I went out and bought this thing so as to keep someone from taking $12 out of my cash register, do you? I bought it just to keep you and your whore from breaking into my house. I heard Ron's stunned voice saying slowly, You crazy bastard. But I heard it as in a dream. I must have fainted. All I remember was the gun pointed at us and that voice, which I can only describe as evil. I didn't know how we'd gotten there, 
but suddenly Ron and I were in the street. He held me. I was trembling like a leaf. I couldn't walk. I asked him to take me to my house. He almost carried me. When I opened the door, I begged him to stay with me, not to go back to his house. Won't your father blow my head off? He didn't know who Alberts was. He hadn't once asked me anything about myself. No one's going to shoot you here. I'll introduce you in the morning. The following morning, we all had breakfast together. As we told the story of our previous night's escapade, Sabina laughed and Louisa gasped. Alberts paid no attention to the story of Ron, although when he saw Ron reach into the pocket of his leather jacket and pull out an empty cigarette pack, he offered Ron a cigarette and lit it for him. Louisa visibly didn't like Ron. She made no effort to hide her fear of him. Sabina was drawn to him like a needle to a magnet. Ron stayed with us in my room for a week. He didn't go to school, and he left the house only once during school hours, when neither his father nor his mother were at home. He brought back three bicycles. That weekend, although both of them acted as if Ron and I were married, Sabina and Ron became good friends, lifetime friends. Their relationship lasted until Ron was killed. We rode to a forest. At night, I slept with Sabina. Ron slept by himself. The previous night had been our last night alone together. When we got back, Ron telephoned his mother. Her name is Debbie. She cried all the time she talked to him, telling him she thought he had left for good. She had come out of her room before we had left the house and had seen Matthews pointing the gun at us. She had grabbed the gun, hysterically slapped his face with it, and told him to get out of the house and never come back. Matthews had returned two days later with a gift, begged her forgiveness, and even promised to apologize to Ron. Debbie begged Ron to return and told him the gun had been taken away with the garbage. Ron decided to go home. I experienced my last escapade with Ron shortly after that. He came over on a weeknight and asked us to go riding. We went out expecting to find bikes. He had a car. It's the old man's, he explained. He's all soft on me now. He hands me the keys and says, Here, punk, you want to take your broad for a ride? His imitation was perfect. I believed him. Where were you going to take us, I asked. Where would you like to go, he asked. To the beach, Sabina answered. Ron drove us to the lake. The three of us were alone on the enormous sandy beach. It was a moonlit night. Ron removed his clothes and ran into the water. Sabina ran after him. Hey, Sophie, he called. You coming? I'm cold, I yelled back. Have fun in there. I heard them splashing, shouting, laughing. I looked up at the stars. After a while, I no longer heard them. The only sound came from the water hitting the shore. I don't know how long we were there. When I woke up, Ron was carrying me in his arms. They were both dressed. He let me down when I objected to being carried. Sabina gently pushed me to the front seat of the car before going in, so that I sat between them. I was sure they had made love. Neither of them said anything. Making a sudden turn off the main road, Ron asked, as if he'd just thought of it, Hey, Sophie, you remember that first night when I told you I'd show you how the other half lives? Well, feast your eyes, because this is where they live. I stared blankly at enormous mansions surrounded by fountains and gardens. The only places like it I'd been before had been museums or public monuments. Here we drove past, and one after another mansion, each with its own beach and dock. But the last day of my tour came to an abrupt and unpleasant end. Three boys in a sports car drove up to us and cruised next to us. They were obviously residents of the mansions. Ron said, oh shit, let's get out of here. Those creeps will get the cops on me and I don't have a license. One of the boys shouted, imitating inner city slang, Hey, Hood, what you doing with the spare broad? I'm not eating shit from a silver spoon like you, bozo, Ron answered. He pulled into a driveway, turned the car around, and headed back towards the highway. They caught up to us at the light. Where'd you steal that limousine, boy? shouted another one. Sabina stretched herself to the window and shouted, Why aren't you in your baby carriage, mama's boy? To which Ron added, Get that can off the road before I tear it up with my can opener. Ron pulled away at the light, but when the oncoming traffic had passed, they pulled up alongside us, driving on the wrong side of the road. One of them shouted, Thieves and whores aren't permitted on this highway, and another added, Yeah, we saw your picture in the post office, and there's a posse out looking for you. Sabina, who knew as much about cars as I did, urged Ron to drive faster. He pressed the gas pedal to the floor, but they stayed alongside us, shouting, Give her all she's got, boy, and they'll sign you up in the kitty car races. Then they flew ahead of us, swerving to avoid an oncoming car and just barely missing Ron's car. Those rich bastards don't give a shit if they pile up those souped-up cars. Go th they go through them like toys, Ron muttered. I, characteristically, started to tremble. Ron, slow down, I pleaded. Let's just close the window, ignore them. They'll get bored. Sabina objected. Catch up to them! Run into them! She was obviously as unconcerned about the Matthews car as the rich boys were about theirs. 
When they were alongside again, one of them shouted, You'll never get anywhere that way, boy. Let the girls get out and push. Ron yelled back, This ain't no car, kiddo. It's a bulldozer. Sabina shouted, We'll flatten you out and use you as rugs. I shouted to Sabina, You're crazy. Tell him to slow down. Sabina shouted to me, Coward, you're just like your mother. Suddenly we were blinded by the bright lights of an oncoming car. The sports car bumped us and apparently moved us to the extreme right side of the road because we were heading straight into a parked car. Ron slammed on the brakes, but we piled into the car's trunk. We heard the sports car speed around the corner. They disappeared. Ron got out. He kicked the fender and said, Shit, it's wrecked. The cops will be here any minute. Suddenly he rushed into the car, grabbed the key, and said with urgency, Come on, let's get out of here. I got out. Ron and Sabina rushed around a corner, but I walked along the highway. Ron came up behind me and grabbed my arm. Come on, Sophie, you're making it easy for the police. I shook myself loose and continued walking. I let the tears run freely down my face and could barely see where I was going. Too many things had happened that night. I was alone again. I was hurt and humiliated. I kept repeating Sabina's last comment before the crash. That caused me greater pain than everything else that had happened. She might say it today, not in anger, but coldly and analytically. It's obviously true. I must have been walking for at least an hour when Ron and Sabina rode up to me on bicycles. Get on the bar, Sophie, Ron said, half pleading, half ordering. I ignored them and walked on. Come on, smartass, you still got almost ten miles to go. I didn't care if I had a hundred. The last thing I'd heard him say was, oh shit. He was probably waiting to see if I'd hesitate. I didn't. I walked and sobbed. I knew I wasn't going to spend any more weekends bicycling with Ron. I also knew I wasn't ever going to write my novel about him. I did see Ron again, twice. I saw him more than a year after the car wreck, in a courtroom, when he was on trial for a robbery. And I saw him again for the last time, after he was released from reform school. But on both of those occasions, I saw a completely different person. As I walked away from his father's wrecked car, I knew that the Ron I had known, the Ron I had loved, had been an illusion. Ron may in fact have been a rebel, but his rebellion wasn't one I understood. His life's project wasn't mine. I had never known Ron. As I walked home sobbing, I knew I'd never used those notes I had scribbled about him. He was as out of place in my life's project as I was in his. I learned long after the event that Tom Matthews had not in fact lent Ron the keys to the car. Ron had taken them from his father's pants pocket. After the collision, when he had rushed into the car and grabbed the keys, Ron had already planned a strategy, which succeeded up to a point. He and Sabita rode two bicycles straight out of a luxurious garage and rushed to Ron's house after they'd convinced themselves I wouldn't go along. Ron slipped the keys back into Tom's pants pocket. In the morning, Ron and Sabina joined Tom and Debbie Matthews at breakfast. Ron introduced Sabina, and Tom was extremely friendly towards her since he took her to be the broad he had almost shot. Then Ron established his alibi. Hope we didn't wake you last night when we came in at one. Sure was a quiet night, no fire engines or anything. He hoped they hadn't been awake at one and that there had been, in fact, no nearby fires. He had guessed correctly and had almost carried out his strategy. Matthew predictably returned to his house right after he'd left. The car's gone. That's when Ron almost ruined his whole plan. Jesus Christ, that's terrible, Pop. We gotta call the police right away. His concern was so excessive and so uncharacteristic that Tom became suspicious immediately and gradually convinced himself it was Ron who had wrecked the car. Characteristically, Ron would have said, what the hell do you expect? Or it was bound to happen sooner or later. To express concern, he would have most said, oh shit. Matthew's suspicions were confirmed by the police investigators who insisted the thief must have had a key since there was no sign the car had been broken into. None of this proved Ron had stolen it since many car thieves have universal keys and the police don't always figure out just how a car is stolen. Debbie was unshakably convinced that Ron was innocent. She firmly believed Ron had come home at one and had spent a quiet night with Sabina. But Tom was firmly convinced Ron had stolen and wrecked his car. He knew he couldn't prove anything. His anger simmered for over a year when he finally found a bizarre way to get even with his hated son. This episode coincided with an uproar that took place at my house about which I know nothing at all, strange as this may seem. A few nights after the car wreck, when I returned to my house from a lonely walk, I found Sabina and Albert's packing suitcases. I asked what was going on, but neither of them would say a word to me. I included that my behavior after the car wreck was at the root of it, and I became hysterical. I grabbed Sabina, shook her, and screeched at her, it's because we're cowards that you're leaving us. You're not a coward. You want us all to get killed. Sabina shook herself loose and turned to me with a look of fierce hatred, saying only, Mind your own business, Sophia. I ran to my room and bawled. They slammed the door when they left. 
When Louisa came in several hours later, I was still bawling. She must have heard me, but she went straight to her room and closed the door. I ran to her room and threw the door open. I could see she had been crying, too. What's the matter with you? I screeched. Go to bed, Sophia. This has nothing to do with you, was all she said. And that's all I ever learned about what happened. I never saw Alberts again. He and Sabina moved into another house, not far from ours. I later learned that Ron moved in with them. His father's suspicions had made Ron feel unsafe in his own house. This permanent departure obviously turned his father's suspicion into certainty. Ron no longer came to visit our house. For a short time, I had glimpses of him in school, but I avoided him. When his mother was fired, he quit school, and I no longer saw him there either. Louisa and I were alone, and I hated it. I hated being where, where I was. I'd become nothing, and I'd done nothing. All I could see ahead of me was an endless desert and an inner void. I shuffled to school and back as indifferently, as mechanically as I had during my first days here. But I no longer took notes, and I no longer looked for people who resembled those I had once known. I don't know how fair it is to put it this way. I became what your letter seems to advocate. I lost my illusions. I stopped trying to interpret my existence, to compare it, to grasp its meaning. I simply underwent a meaningless routine passively and indifferently. I became an object. My present friends tell me I still frequently lapse into the pose I acquired during those days. I stop paying attention, stare blankly, and move like a robot. They flatteringly assume I'm lost in thought, but I'm not. My mind is a complete blank. I don't understand your letter, because for me those moments without illusions are not moments when I experience reality. They're moments when I don't experience anything at all. Moments which I imagine are very similar to death. My only crutch during those last moments in high school was Louisa. She never abandoned her dreams. She never let herself be reduced in an inert thing. If she sometimes became desperate, it wasn't because she lost her grip on her past, but because the present failed to live up to it. I leaned on Louisa again after I read your letter. Yes, I showed her your letter, in spite of all the pain it caused me and in spite of your warning. It was in fact Louisa who formulated my arguments against your philosophy of universal guilt. If I hadn't shared your letter with her, I wouldn't have been able to answer it. I would have only cried until it receded in my memory as yet another bad experience, until I suppressed it. I called Louisa a few days after your letter came. I tried to warn her before she read it. I told her you had changed very much as a result of your imprisonment. She could also read on my face that I hadn't received a joyful letter. But she didn't read it as I had. She didn't cry. She wasn't torn by it. She became increasingly enraged. You were wrong about the effect your letter might have on her. Your revised portrait of her can't be more accurate than the one you've suppressed. Louisa didn't read your letter as an attack aimed at her, but as a confession about yourself. He certainly has changed, she said. These aren't the arguments of a comrade who is still committed to the struggle. They're the arguments of a former comrade who has become a reactionary. He's confessing that he now thinks the struggle was nothing but a trick of his memory and a youthful illusion. Even if Louisa didn't see your letter as an attack, she must have felt attacked by it since all her reactions to it were defensive. I latched onto every one of her defensive reactions because she was defending me as well. She dismissed your treatment of our revolutionary experience as illusory. That's nothing but a thinly disguised justification for the status quo. The present is real, the opposition to it is illusory. She reminded me that she had spotted one of your characteristic arguments already in your first letter. That Christian proposition that we're all responsible for our own conditions, that serfs are responsible for feudalism and workers for capitalism. He talks as if historical systems imposed on people by force were the outcomes of their struggle against them. She didn't even comment on your descriptions of her past experiences and simply dismissed all of them as reactionary arguments bolstered by fabricated facts. He obviously didn't meet any Manuel when he was in prison. Manuel is nothing but a name he gave to his reactionary arguments. In his next letter, he'll tell us he met Jesus in prison. Yaristan had a hard life, haven't we all? But not all of us have used that as an excuse for denying our experiences and turning our backs on our comrades. I didn't read your letter as the confessions of an insurgent who had turned reactionary. I knew you hadn't renounced our struggle for a human community. I knew you hadn't turned against the dreams we had shared. That's why I was so hurt by your letter. But Louisa nevertheless communicated her anger to me and in fact stimulated me to formulate arguments against the parts of your letter I found offensive. The most offensive are precisely the sections which deal with Louisa, the sections which contrast her supposed illusions with some supposed reality. I'm convinced that in those passages you simply don't know what you're talking about. Louisa's experiences after her release were no more edifying than mine. 
The reality to which she came was not more real, meaningful, or human than what you call her illusory past experiences. The shedding of illusions, which you seem to advocate, would not have set Louise on her feet. Without those dreams based on past experiences, she would simply have been a caged bird without hope of release, as you describe Vesna. The only mystery to me is why she ever consented to coming here. Why she let Alberts take it away from her struggle and her comrades. Did she actually hope to find a more meaningful struggle here? Or was Sabina's explanation complete? Did Louisa consent to that flight only because of cowardice, because she feared long imprisonment? If so, she made a tragic mistake. She would escaped from a cell only to land in a tomb. She landed in an environment where she permanently remained a foreigner, an environment that did not contain more meaningful struggles nor more human comrades. What's surprising is not that she froze her memories of earlier experiences, but that she retained them at all. Her new world didn't contain anything that reminded her of those experiences. After a lifetime of agitation with fellow workers, after the experience of several social dramas in which the foundation of the ruling order was shaken, she found herself in a world where the ruling order had never even been challenged. Louisa got a job shortly after Alberts and Sabina left her house. She started working on an assembly line in an auto plant. She still has the same job today. From the very first day, she tried to communicate with the people at work. She met people who were experts in watching baseball games, people who had memorized unbelievable lists of trivia from the sports pages and newspapers, people who knew nothing at all about the events she has experienced. They were not only ignorant of all the struggles in which workers had fought for themselves, but proud of their ignorance. They were workers who had become what they are for capital, labor time, the exchangeable and expendable entity you compared to excrement. They were dead as human beings. Louisa's hopes rose when she was accepted into the union. She couldn't wait to attend her first union meeting. She thought she'd find a comrade, perhaps even more than one. Instead of comrade, she found comic book He-Man, whose model was the uniform killer in the war hero movies. A friend of mine, Damon, I'll tell you more about him later, claims that the post-war generation of workers Louisa met when she started working was every bit as militant as every other generation. If he's right, then workers here are a different breed from those I used to know or else what he means by militancy is very strange. In any case, Damon derives his facts from his political ideology. The workers Louisa met aspired precisely to those things capital afford them. The house filled with commodities, the grotesque hunk of metal on wheels that has to be replaced every year, the standardized universal household appliance known as a wife, and two and a half little ones to replenish the labor market. The political commitment of these workers consisted of admiration for the army and the police, their main political observation was, we'll smash them. And by we, they meant our army and police. Never before have workers been so completely despoiled of their human characteristics. The union meetings Louisa attended couldn't have been very different from those of the state-run union you've become familiar with. Only a handful of workers attended, all of them men. These men never dreamed of meeting with each other to discuss strategies for taking over the plants, they didn't even discuss strategies for eliminating health and safety hazards or for slowing down the pace of the work. The fact is that they didn't even have strategies for fighting for wage raises. This was the role of the gangs of racketeers who capitalized on the prices of wage labor. At one meeting, the union members discussed a picnic, a Sunday outing, which was also to be attended by the wives and the children. What they discussed was who would bring the punch and the silverware. For these men, the union meeting served as the same function church meetings served for others. Louisa was as out of place at the union meeting as she would have been in a men's toilet. Several men made crude jokes about women. The biggest joke of all was her presence at the meeting. These union meetings were part of what Louisa called the workers' movement. The men could see no reason for Louisa's presence at the meeting and thought she had gone there in quest of a he-man like each of them. The workers' movement was dead. If there had once been one here, then this was its corpse, and the air would have stunk less if the corpse had been buried instead of being left exposed. It had become putrid. What did Louisa have in this world except what you call her illusions? If she had shed those illusions, she would have been more like the Louisa you remembered and discarded. Or would she have been no more than defeated workers on that bus you drove? Should she have accepted herself as a wage earning machine, decorated her house, bought a car, used up her life exchanging it for objects, and forgotten that she had once experienced human life as something altogether different? She did, in fact, use up most of her life exchanging it for a wage, but she didn't erase her past experiences from her memory, and she didn't stop trying to realize the dreams she had failed to realize in the past. 
In time, Louisa did find comrades with whom she was able to communicate. In time, she even took part in, in events which had some semblance of social significance, which in some small way resembled the large events she had experienced in the past. Without her dreams, without those illusions you now find so objectionable, she wouldn't have looked for comrades who differed from the professional admirers of baseball pitchers, and she wouldn't have recognized them if she had met them. It seems to me that if Louisa had followed your advice and shed her illusions, she would have confronted the same hopeless situation you faced during the days after your release. If she had to choose between giving up the dreams for which she had fought or committing suicide, I suspect she would ultimately have chosen suicide, in spite of the cowardice Sabina takes to be Louisa's main quality. Turning her back on everything she had fought for and yet remaining alive as a mere quantity of labor time, exchangeable for money, would have meant remaining alive as a corpse, an entity that no longer has any life in it. The only one of us who lived up to the standards your letter sets up is George Alberts. He shed all his illusions, but I don't really think you would hold him up as any sort of model in spite of the fact that you might feel apologetic because you were once suspicious of him. I can't say when it was that Albert suppressed his dreams or if he ever had any. I was never close to him. I don't know how deep his commitment was when he fought alongside Nachello, Luisa, and Titus Sabran. I only know that he and Titus helped Luisa escape from that struggle when I was only two. Twelve years later, he helped Luisa escape again, pulling me away from you. And I know that he had neither dreams nor illusions when we settled here. He had neither principles nor scruples. Alberts can't always have been the unscrupulous person I knew, since Luisa respected him once and considered him a comrade. And Sabina, who was anything but uncritical, used to adore him. She considered him a god not only when she was a child, but until her late teens, long after she ceased to depend on him financially. Years after she and Alberts left our house, Sabina mysteriously left him. She hasn't seen him since. I don't know if he suddenly changed or if Sabina suddenly saw him as I had always seen him. Most of what I know about Alberts I learned during the brief period when he lived with us after we got here. He transported Louisa and me like country relatives, like baggage he had left behind. He disposed of us as if he were the one who was responsible for our lives. He lodged us in the house as if we were furniture or exotic animals. He was our keeper. His role was to house, clothe, and feed us. Our role was to cease to be exotic to learn to behave like the furniture in all the other little houses. Louisa became aware of the nature of her relationship to him almost as soon as we got here. They never touched each other. I don't remember that they ever talked to each other. I really can't imagine how they related to each other earlier. Although Louisa is unwilling to talk about him as Sabina, I think the reason she asked him to leave our house is that she knew what a despicable role model he had played in an event I only learned about years later and only by chance. Alberts had begun his teaching career here during a period of reaction. Individuals who were nonconformists, or had been in the past diverged from the official model, were being fired from their jobs. Our century seems to have outrun all previous epochs in hysterical witch hunts. Subversive teachers were a choice target for inquisitions. In my school, one rumor followed on the tale of another. Every teacher in the school was at one or another time accused of being a subversive. I had known only the outcome. Debbie Matthews and two others were fired. George Alberts continued to teach. Years later, I learned that Alberts had been on friendly terms with the three fired teachers. He had introduced himself to them, continually engaged with them in discussions, and acted as if he had been their friend for years. Yet when the official inquisition began, he characterized each of them in colorful detail and with dossiers of documentation as a person who had daily intercourse with the devil, as a Pied Piper who was pulling school children straight down into hell. He became a Mr. Nanovo, a state agent. He shed all of those qualities you call illusions, solidarity, comradeship, even sheer decency. He actually did to several people what you say Claude had once wanted to do to him. Only Claude failed where Albert succeeded. You tell me Claude and Adrian were suspicious of Albert's, and then you became suspicious too. You pretend that something was wrong with the three of you while nothing about Albert's was strange. You exaggerate. I was suspicious of Titus Sabran and of Alberts as well. They were not among the people I considered my comrades. But this doesn't mean I wanted to jail them. I never in my life dreamed of a situation where I'd have the power to do that. While Louisa was reading the, your letter, she made a crude comment about you. I didn't consider it relevant at the time, but now I think it reveals something else about Alberts. She said, George considered him a hooligan. He was right. Yaristan moves from absolute destruction to absolute acceptance. The two extremes meet because he's moving along the circumference of a circle without ever stepping inside. 
he's always rejected real struggles. I don't accept Louisa's analysis because I don't think your letter indicates absolute acceptance. What interests me is that Albert's considered you a destructive hooligan. That's revealing because it's exactly what our jailers called us. Do you think Claude had no reason at all to be suspicious of Albert's? I doubt that. I suspect that Claude knew something about Albert's involvement with those who arrested us. I suspect that Albert's was already then saving his skin by ranting and raving about subversives and hooligans. I suspect that Albert's had already then shed his illusions and accommodated himself to the realities. Would you like Louisa better if she had done that? I suspect not, since your portraits of Mr. Nanovo are not drawn with any great sympathy for that type of person. Even if you're right, if Claude's suspicion was groundless, if Albert's was at the time selflessly devoted to his comrades, what would this prove? That Claude's and your suspicion of Albert's indicate a mentality similar to that of the police? That's ridiculous. My lack of trust in someone simply meant I preferred not to work with him. It couldn't possibly mean that I wanted him jailed, since my entire life's project aimed at the abolition of jails and jailers. Our project was to communicate, not excommunicate. By this point, I've convinced myself that you didn't mean half of what you said in your letter. There are too many contradictions. You must have let yourself be carried away by your own rhetoric. The only person I know who seemed to have lived up to your demand that we shed our illusions is George Alberts, and he's obviously not your model of a fully developed human being. Even if he were, neither Louisa nor I could have followed Albert's path. Neither she nor I could have saved our skins by selling or repressing our insides. Why would you have written me in the first place if you had thought I had suppressed my wants and had become a commodity that walks and speaks? Isn't it enough that the world I live in mobilizes all its forces to suppress my wants and dreams? Why should I let my own will be recruited alongside those forces? Why should I let myself become a mere function of my environment? And why would you want to exchange letters with such a function? The functions are as predictable as they are dull. Shedding our illusions, repressing our wants, forgetting our possibilities. These are the slogans of the ruling order. Coming from you, they sound bizarre. I became a function again a few weeks ago. After all, self-repression, even if only temporary, is still the condition of survival in this society. Yet I don't completely repress my desires even when my survival depends on it. In my first letter, I told you how I had lost my last job during last year's riots. I enjoyed being unemployed since then, but I don't want Tina to support me, so I sold myself again. Damon Hesper, a college friend who is now a university professor, told me about an opening for something called a sociology instructor in something called a community college. My job there is to lecture to workers three evenings a week. The whole thing is designed to give people the illusion they're moving while in fact they're standing still. It's like a simulated railway car where the moving scenery is actually a projection on the screen. First of all, I have no idea what sociology is, and I'm convinced it's nothing more than a job classification. Someone is a sociologist the same way someone is a director or a secretary. Secondly, the community college deserves every attribute except community, which is not merely lacking, but is negated by this very institution. Thirdly, the workers who attend my course are precisely those workers whose aim in life is to oppress other workers. In fact, the sole purpose of this activity, euphemistically called adult education, is to provide credentials to aspiring foremen, union bosses, and even managers. The role of the credentials is to give these people an appearance of legitimacy as order givers. The students experience this evening courses as one of Hercules' labors. This is one of the many arbitrary rites which are performed as part of the initiation to a higher rung on an endless ladder. Fourthly, I don't give any lectures. That's my own innovation. The first day I simply sat down and waited, like everyone else. When one of the students got up to leave, I asked him if he'd stay if someone else in the room turned out to be the instructor. He didn't answer, but he stayed. I was, of course, suspect number one. Someone else then got up to leave. He was quite determined and quite angry. He said he was going home since the teacher, even if present, obviously wasn't doing her job. I suggested that instead of going home, he should report such a teacher to the school authorities, since he had paid his fee and wasn't getting anything in return. Everyone seemed to agree, so I added, whenever you see someone who isn't doing his job, you should report him to the authorities. At this point, he lost a determination and returned to his seat. Of course, at this point, I had given myself away. I was asked if I intended to continue not doing my job, and I said I did. An argument began. Some didn't like to be cheated. When they drop a coin into a cigarette machine, they want either the cigarette or the coin return. Others didn't think it was right to be informers. The argument continued for half an hour after the class was scheduled to end. 
It was I who got up and put on my coat. I was asked if I'd be there again next time, and I said I would. I should probably have said I didn't know. Every single student returned for the next session. They talked almost exclusively to each other during the entire session. Yet if they had known I wasn't going to be there, none of them would have come back. Isn't that funny? If dogs were officially certified as sociology instructors, a room full of people supplied with the right dog would qualify as a sociology class. Yet some of my so-called colleagues think the students come to be ennobled by the precious words which drop like diamonds from their mouths. During an argument about sabotage, mostly about how to stop it, unfortunately, one of the students triumphantly shouted, but this is sociology for Christ's sake. I never knew it was so interesting. Everyone seemed to agree with that comment except me, although I characteristically said nothing. I disagreed because it wasn't socio anything. It was pure time serving for the sake of future rewards. My remuneration is immediate. Theirs is deferred. The slogan that describes the activity in its entirety is education pays. If everyone agreed that these sessions were interesting, you can imagine what the other courses are like, the ones where lecturers impart wisdom to ignorant and attentive listeners. The fact is that the sessions are not interesting. The language, the concepts, and even the experiences that are discussed are hardly ever an individual's own. They're almost always the stock terms, the trivial ideas, and the stereotyped experiences repeated daily by the propaganda apparatus. These people speak the language and think the images on the signs you described. These sessions are nothing more than forms of adapting to boredom. They reinforce closed minds and negate the very possibility of learning. The anticipation, exploration, and adventure involved in every experience of learning are lacking. There's no feeling of discovery. Everything that's discussed is predictable. Every insight is already known. If this is interesting, what must the rest of their lives be like? I'll obviously be fired sooner or later, but by then I'll have saved up some money again and won't have to depend on Tina. If I'm not fired soon enough, I'll quit. Why? Because I experienced learning, comradeship, and community in that event you tried so hard to smear and distort, and therefore I refuse to accept this activity as anything but a degrading sham. I decided during my first teaching job that I wasn't going to let myself be reduced to a means of production for the production of means of production. It's true that merely by accepting this job, I play a role similar to the one you played when you drove your bus, but I don't do any of the driving. The only discussion in which I took in any part at all was the discussion about sabotage. Only one of the students had anything good to say about sabotage. It might be necessary under certain circumstances. I eagerly asked with him what types of sabotage he was personally familiar with. Although his accounts were tame and he lumped simple gestures of solidarity together with sabotage, that was the only time I felt I was communicating with someone. The only time we talked about our activity in the light of a different, unrealized yet possible activity. He was mildly interested when I told him I had known workers who had locked up the owners and had run the plan on their own. But as far as all the other students were concerned, I had started to talk in a foreign language. I've tried to show you that my whole life has revolved around this experience I shared with you, and that all my life I've sought to communicate with you. I hope I've clarified what I mean. Without that experience, my life is reduced to the life of a lifeless object. It becomes the period of time during which the object is consumed a trivial episode in the life of capital. On my way to my job, I take a bus through the part of the city where the city's life takes place, and I pass through there during the hours when the city's inhabitants do their living. The city's life consists of a display of commodities, behind glass, behind concrete walls, on screens. Life is a proliferation of items for sale. Everything from toilet bowls to human beings has a price tag. All art, philosophy, science, and history the entire past and present of humanity are enjoyed, not by individuals, but by money. Life doesn't consist of projection, communication, or creation, but of a wallet with bills inside. The act of living consists of spending money for which living time is exchanged during the working day. The only shred of human life in this dance of objects with corpses is the struggle to destroy the dehumanizing game. The only shred of humanity in me is the memory of that struggle. I think you're wrong when you say memory of our struggle is frozen. I think the fact that it informs every moment of my present life means that it's very much alive. I do know someone in whom similar past experiences and hopes are frozen. That's my friend Damon, the one who helped me find my job. His one-time commitment has become his profession. His past experience is the subject of his lecture notes. He's been teaching for three or four years now. He's enacted the same revolution in his classroom year after year. 
He's broken it down into assignments and test questions. He froze and packaged his life's dreams and sold them to his employers. He has been thawing and serving them in sauces to customers who simply swallow them along with the other ingredients in the sauce. I haven't done that to my past. Whether or not you intended it, you validated the very dreams your arguments dismissed as illusions. You told me that people who had seemed to be no more than inert objects were turning into human beings. You told me that human voices could again be heard in a space where human voices had seemed forever drowned by the sounds of electrical contrivances. You told me that my hopes and Louisa's hopes were coming back to life, yet you insist that neither Louisa nor I ever shared those hopes. Louisa was obviously wrong when she said you had become a reactionary. If you had, you wouldn't be able to describe what's happening around you. But why do you insist Louisa and I were reactionaries all along? If that were true, we wouldn't understand your descriptions. We couldn't begin to grasp what you meant by a new birth of dreams, of projects, of communications. What's alive in my memory, what you claim I froze, is precisely what causes your enthusiasm about the events you describe. Communication about such events is what I've missed ever since I've been here. Your letter brings me so close to realizing this communication and then slams the door in my face. I'm begging. I know it. I really don't think I deserved your letter. I wasn't your jailer. You weren't arrested either because of my relation to George Alberts or because of the letter I sent to you by way of Lem. Neither Louisa nor I shackled you with a distorted view of the past. Louisa wasn't your nurse when you were too young to formulate your own thoughts, and she wasn't a hypnotist who insinuated herself into your consciousness while you were in a trance. The most significant moments of my life were not moments during which I deformed your dreams and destroyed your possibilities. My previous letter was not a glorification of your imprisonment, but a call for warmth, comradeship, and understanding. Please don't leave our relationship where your last letter left it. You would be killing something I've kept alive in an environment which tried repeatedly to kill it and failed. Please don't drive me out of the single context in which I haven't felt like an outsider. Please don't put an end to the only real friendship I've succeeded in forming. Apprehensively, with love, your Sophia.